Let us start. Hare Krishna. Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Jnananjana Salakaya Tatyurunmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Guru Venamaha Thank you very much, Shashri, for reciting the Mangla Charan and the verse for today. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Hare Krishna Navdit Chandra Das Prabhuji, Danvat Pranam, please accept our humble obeisances on behalf of everybody who has joined the group and are about to join Prabhuji. Prabhuji, thank you so much for giving your time today and, um, uh, and rising up to the occasion, Prabhuji, on the last minute. So we really appreciate your time, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, this group meets every day uh, and we do one text every day, including the weekends. Um, uh, Prabhuji, um, we usually read the text and the word-to-word um, uh, -word translation and purport, um, and then hand over to our mentor. And for today, you are our mentor. 
Um, uh, Prabhuji, how would you like us to uh, continue? Uh, yes, uh, just continue as your normal normal program. That would be nice. Okay. And Prabhuji, we usually record the session and then we have a YouTube link, uh, a channel there. So is it okay if we put this on the YouTube after the class? Yes, yes. I don't, we, will, we will share the recording with you if you would like, but uh, that so that the devotees who haven't been able to join, they usually catch up by uh, listening to the recording. Yes, that's fine. No problem. Thank you for your permission, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, uh, Iskon Eldoret, um, I won't spend mu much time, uh, but we have two great mentors, uh, Path Prema Das Prabhuji and Mansi Ganga Mataji, who uh, guide us uh, during um, our um, uh, sadhana and seva and uh, our um, spiritual growth. And we, uh, we are a very small center. We started two and a half years ago and we are just slowly baby steps progressing. We are in a small town in, called Eldoret where all the runners come from. The Kenyan runners come from our town. Oh, here. yes, yes, they're famous. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's where we belong. Outside our house, you'll see runners running, lots of people practicing. So it's a nice, quaint little town. All right, let's start then. Um, Arya Govindas Prabhuji, would you mind reading the uh, text word to word translation and Soni Mataji, if you can go on with the purport for today? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Arya Govindas Prabhuji. Okay, he, uh, Prabhuji might have challenges. Uh, he's writing on the chat. Please, uh, Soni Mataji, continue the session. I can read the purport later on. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just for Prabhuji's benefit, you can put on your video and then switch it off so Prabhuji knows who's talking. Okay. We'll try. Um, the what word? Shnavatam. Shnavatam. Those who have developed the urge to hear the messages of those who have developed the urge to hear the message of Shwa Katha, Shwa Katha, his own words, his own words, Krishna, Krishna, the personality of Godhead, the personality of Godhead, Punya, Punya, virtues, virtues, Shravana, Shravana. Hearing, hearing, kirtana, kirtana, chanting, chanting, antashta, with antashta, one's own heart, within one's heart. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, he, he, certainly, certainly, abadrani, abadrani. Desire to enjoy matter. Desire to enjoy matter. Vidu noti. Vidu noti. Cleanses. Cleanses. Surut. Shrut. Benefactor. Benefactor. Satam. Satam. Of the truthful. Of the truthful. Translation. Shri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma, Super Soul, in everyone's heart, and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Perfect by Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Yeah. Messages of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, are non different from Him. Whenever, therefore, offenseless hearing and glorification of God are undertaken, it is to be understood that Lord Krishna is present there in the form of transcendental sound, which is as powerful as the Lord personally. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Shishtashtakam, 
declares clearly that the holy name of the Lord has all the potencies of the Lord and that he has endowed his innumerable names with the same potency. There is no rigid fixtures of time and anyone can chant the holy name with attention and reverence at his convenience. The Lord is so kind to us that he can present before us personally in the form of transcendental sound. But unfortunately, we have no taste for hearing and glorifying the Lord's name and activities. We have already discussed developing a taste for hearing and chanting the holy sound. It is done through the medium of service to the pure devotees of the Lord. The Lord is reciprocally respondent to his devotees. When he sees that a devotee is completely sincere in getting admittance to the transcendental service of the Lord and thus becomes eager to hear about him, the Lord acts from within the devotee in such a way that the devotee may easily go back to him. The Lord is more anxious to take us back into his kingdom than we can desire. Most of us do not desire at all to go back to Godhead. Only a very few men want to go back to Godhead. But anyone who desires to go back to Godhead, Sri Krishna helps in all respects. One cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless one is perfectly cleared of all sins. The material sins are products of our desire to Lord in our material nature. It is very difficult to get rid of such desires. Women and wealth are very difficult problems for the devotees making progress on the path back to Godhead. Many stalwarts in the devotional line fell victim to these allurements and thus retreated from the path of liberation. But when one is helped by the Lord himself, the whole process becomes as easy as anything by the divine grace of the Lord. To become restless in the contact of women and wealth is not an astonishment because every living being is associated with such things from remote time, practically immemorial and it takes time to recover from this foreign nature. But if one is engaged in hearing the glories of the Lord, gradually he realizes his real position. By the grace of God, such a devotee gets sufficient strength to defend himself from the state of disturbance and gradually all disturbing elements are eliminated from his mind. Hare Krishna. Prabhuji, we now hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Om Gyan Iti Miran Nasya Gyan Anjana Shalakya Chakshurun Melitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Vinaya So thank you for reading that verse and the purport. It is a very nice... Um, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, okay. It is a very comprehensive purport where Srila Prabhupada emphasizes uh, some fundamental points regarding our Krishna conscious practice. In fact, this verse is, is part of a series of verses which really start around uh, verse 12 from roughly from verse 12 to 20. Um, and these basically describe a, um, a series, a progression, which takes us right from the very initial stages of Krishna consciousness right up to a very advanced stage. Now in this purport, Srila Prabhupada um, has emphasized the help that Krishna provides when we wish to make some advancement. Now I'm sure everyone here and uh, we can observe people in, in general, um, at some point in their life they develop uh, a desire to inquire, maybe to uh, uh, 
engage more in some kind of transcendental practice, so, something different to their norm. You know, in normal life, everyone is encouraged to, to you know, eat, sleep, work, um, the normal aspects of life, work, study, uh, have recreation, enjoy, sleep, all, all of these things. These are the, the items that everyone does in life. But sometimes a, a person starts to wonder, is there, is there something more than this? Is there anything else? Is there someone superior? And they may have heard about God, maybe in their own culture, maybe in their own tradition, but they never took it seriously. And uh, maybe at some point someone starts to um, contemplate a little. Then something magical happens because Krishna starts, uh, starts to notice this individual. And he starts to supply certain um, certain directions, certain guidances. And often the devotee doesn't really uh, know them so directly. But within the heart, Krishna inspires the person, go this way, go that way. Uh, sometimes um, people come to the temple and uh, uh, if they're new, you know, we ask them, uh, what brought you here? And sometimes they say, I don't know. <laughs> I just I just decided to come here today. More than one person has said that to me. I just had a I just had an urge just to go here. And uh, maybe they were they had heard about the temple in the past, or maybe they had uh, had read a book or come across a book at some point in the past, or they saw a devotee and had a chat with them. Somehow or other, that desire at that moment fructified, and they decided to come to the temple. So, I mean, it might not mean coming to the temple necessarily, but maybe the person starts inquiring in some way about life, philosophy, God. And this can happen at any time. And it is, uh, it is a special favor given by Krishna. That he said to this person, okay, now I'm going to invite you to, to be part of my little world, to, to experience my little world for a while. And who knows at which point someone may get this inspiration. It can be um, lifetimes of wandering in the world, perhaps. Lifetimes and lifetimes. And at some point when one's sins are sufficiently purified, one gets a chance. Maybe it can be the mercy of a, uh, uh, of a very pure Vaishnav um, who will uh, give some inspiration, some potency for an unqualified person to come to Krishna. But really the point is that Krishna is giving us an invitation right from the beginning. Because at a certain point in our life we take Krishna consciousness seriously. Or we at least start to explore it. So um, this is what Prabhupada says, the Lord is reciprocally respondent to his devotees. And as a devotee's uh, sincerity increases, the Lord gives more and more help. He starts giving the devotee, starts giving the aspiring devotee, maybe some lit literature, some shastra. Maybe uh, he gets a chance to hear some transcendental messages, to attend a class, to hear pravachan, maybe even to render service. Actually, this uh, rendering of service is uh, in this series of verses. It's one of the um, one of the uh, uh, starting points. It's one of the triggers for this whole process. Uh, this is in text 15, I think, uh, two verses earlier. Shushrusho shratta dhanasya vasudeva katharuchi syan mahat sevaya vipra punya tirthani shevanat. Syan mahat sevaya vipra. The rendering of service to the Mahatmas, to the great souls. So um, when one actually does that, when one renders service to the great souls, shushrusho shratta one gets a little bit of faith, a little bit of a desire to hear. So Prabhupada is the ideal example of this, that uh, when he provided his association mercifully to various people in the world, and you can say in the start in, in, uh, in New York, in the in the hippie areas in downtown New York and um, he was mercifully supplying his association 
And some of those people desired to, to serve him, and they rendered him some service. Now from that, their qualification to hear about Krishna increased. And they heard Prabhupada, and then that becomes a, a reciprocal cycle. That more hearing about Krishna furthers our desire to render service, and the more service we render, especially to the representative of Krishna, uh, the more purified we become. And so, um, therefore, today's verse uh, is very interesting because it, it mentions that when one engages in this hearing process, and um, especially uh, one has to have developed this urge. So rendering service to the devotee is one of the factors that allows this urge to develop. And then when one does that, when one does that, the material propensities within the heart start to be cleared. When the sincere devotee starts to hear about Krishna, it is, says here, it, it, it is said here, the benefactor of the truthful devotee cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee. Now you see, cleansing the desire of material enjoyment is a, quite a dangerous thing. It is a very dangerous thing for a materialist because their entire life is based upon desires for material enjoyment. And they do not know how to function without material enjoyment. In fact, that is the basis for their aspirations, their goals, all their practices, all their hankering, their lamentation. They want some pleasure and they don't want pain. That is their driving factor. And they're seeking this pleasure within the realm of the material world. So it is the basis for every single non-devotee in the world whether he may be religious or not. Sorry about that, Prabhuji. Okay, was that a question or? I think somebody by mistake um, All right. unmuted. But I've muted everybody, but this was a mistake. Sorry, Prabhuji. No problem, no problem. So Krishna... Um, Krishna is very careful when he starts to cleanse desire for material enjoyment. Um, you see, as one engages in this world and one moves through the world through different species of life, they are acted upon by karma and their desire. So their desire creates for them opportunities and uh, uh, situations, a certain quota, of, of a flavor of experience and according to their karma um, they are restricted or supplied you know one may have a desire to buy a very expensive car but if one doesn't have the sufficient funds in the bank account one won't get it so therefore this karma and desire these two things work together one may have a desire to live maybe like a demigod or something but if one doesn't have the required karma, the required punya, uh, they won't get that. So these two things are important. And that's why in the Bhagavatam it is explained that karmana deva netrena jantur deho papatyaye striya pravishta udaram pumso reta kanashreya. That uh, it is explained that if every living entity with two factors, karmana deva netrena, due to his own karma, and due to the supervision of the Lord, Deva Netrena, the vision, the glance, the supervision of the Lord, enters the womb of a particular mother through the seed given by the father. That is how the living entity takes birth in this world. And it is these two factors that create the opportunities. One has their desire, and then one has karma, which is, um, which is a, 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 a law which is enacted on behalf of the Lord by the material energy. So that's a rigid law. The law of karma is very, uh, very tough, very rigid. <laughs> so if you do something bad in this life, you will get the reaction. Maybe in this life, maybe in future lives. You can't really negotiate. There's no, 
there's no, no, no option for negotiation. You may try to do additional, uh, um, you may take additional measures to purify yourself you know, from a karmakand level. And yes, that will alter the balance of punya and pap that you have. But you see, most people in this world, therefore, are, are operating in this layer. Punya, pap, desire, hankering, and it's all material. They have their senses and they have the unlimited sense objects. And their life consists of the senses trying to receive inputs from more and more sense objects. And so for a devotee, when a person uh, becomes a devotee and starts to want the propensity of, for material enjoyment to be cleared, that is a great achievement. That doesn't happen so easily. And therefore, Krishna is a little careful also. Um, every person suffers in this world, that's clear. And some of those people, through suffering, they come to a desire not to chew the chewed anymore. But they still don't have a positive understanding of what it is. So this can happen, but it's very rare. Um, but when Krishna starts to act within the heart, from within the heart, he starts to purify. You know, as the Gita verse says, Jnana Deepena Bhashwata. From within the heart, he lights the lamp of knowledge and dispels the darkness. So this set of verses, the previous verse, this verse, the next verse, is all centered around this concept, purifying the living entity. Because we have to be pure. As it says in the purport, we have to be pure and sinless before we can re-establish our connection with Krishna, before we can go back to the Lord. So um, it's, uh, it's very nicely stated um, how the Lord uh, comes to us in different ways. Once this process has begun, that the devotee is starting to become a devotee and starting to come closer to Krishna, Krishna starts supplying many factors. And I mentioned books, I mentioned association of devotees, and here Prabhupada emphasizes the holy name, the sound of vibration of the holy name. And this is a very, very powerful process. Just chanting the holy name can uh, purify us in so many ways. It can take us right from a very, very low level of consciousness, a low level of spiritual consciousness, to being pure, perfect devotees who then chant with great rasa, and tasting that nectar of chanting the holy name. But as uh, Prabhupada says in this verse, and as Lord Chaitanya also says in his Shikshashtikam, uh, he says, Nam Nam Kari Bahuda Nija Sarva Shaktis Tatrar Pita Niyamita Smarane Nakalaha Ita Drishitava Kripa Bhagavan Mamapi Dur Daivam Idrishamiha Janinanu Ragaha. This last line is important Dur Daivam. I'm so unfortunate. I'm just, there's something, uh, some lack of fortune, some, I'm just, uh, some problem. Due to a lack of fortune, um, we do not see the potency, the Nija Sarva Shakti, the full potency that you, Krishna, have put inside each and every syllable of your holy name. So, Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nija Sarva Shaktis, there are multiple, multiple names, and in each one of them the Lord has bestowed extremely powerful potency. But we are so unfortunate, we don't, we don't see that. And that's why Prabhupada says here, um, the Lord is so kind to us that uh, He can be present before us personally in the form of transcendental sound, but unfortunately, we have no taste for hearing and glorifying the Lord's name and activities. So that's the problem. And it's a problem that can be overcome. <clears throat> can be overcome, as devotees will tell you. As experienced devotees will tell you, it is a problem that can be overcome with practice. With practice, with patience. With sahan nishchayat dheriyat. Three things required in spiritual life, right? Patience, eagerness, right? Nectar of instruction. Some of there are, there are many qualities, of course, that you can bring 
bring that are required for spiritual life but patience and eagerness are two very very uh, very important ones because with eagerness we we keep enthusiasm for chanting let's say we had a, a bad chanting session today if such a thing is possible <laughs> but but we might not be we not, we might not be happy with our chanting you know today we might think my mind was constantly um, constantly invaded by other thoughts and I I didn't even want to pick or want to chant. I was so relieved when this chanting session was finished. <laughs> so, so we might not be happy without, without chanting. But what we need is we need patience. That we shouldn't give up. Just because, you know, the process might be a little challenging for our material conditioning, it doesn't mean we should give up. The medicine for jaundice is, as Prabhupada says, sugar, sugar candy. When you have jaundice, you don't want to eat the sugar. Because everything sweet that you eat tastes bitter. But you have to keep taking it because it's the medicine. So when that special sweet medicine is taken, over time, the bitter taste in your tongue transforms into sweet. So the resistance we have to chanting the Lord's holy name, to uh, hearing his message, that goes through this process of cleansing. This is why cleansing is mentioned in this verse. Vidunoti, right? Rityantastha hi abhadrani vidunoti surit satam. This is like a washing process, bathing. We have to cleanse ourselves. Just like we cleanse a garment, we have to cleanse our consciousness, which mainly means cleansing our mind and intelligence which are uh, attracted to the wrong things they've been uh, they have been combined together as a good team for furthering material enjoyment all our lives yes that's what the mind and intelligence do that's their occupation to work together under with the ego as the driving motivation my my identity as the enjoyer and they come up with many, many plans to keep enjoying in this world. And largely, these, these types of enjoyment, um, Prabhupada says here, can be largely described just with two, two words, women and money. <laughs> so these are the two age-old, um, the age-old, timeless material enjoyments that everyone is after. The enjoyment of relationship, the enjoyment of amorous interaction. Um, the girl wants the boy, the boy wants the girl. That's the basis of most films. That's the basis of most people's motivations. Um, it, it might seem innocent. There's certainly nothing wrong with it in that sense. Why? Because that propensity for us to enjoy comes from Krishna. But there is a little problem that when we engage and indulge in these things in the material world, a very tight knot is formed in the heart. Ridaya Granti. A very tight knot of attachment is formed. And that combination leads to an expansion of material objects and concepts. And so we start to operate within the world. And our desires for interacting with more and more sense objects just increase and increase. So then what happens? When you complete this life, all the unfulfilled desires that you have, you now have a chance to have another body where you get another chance to try to fulfill those desires. Of course, you never fully manage it because in the material world, you still have your karma to deal with. And your karma might not give you the chance to fulfill those desires. So then you may be frustrated. And that means you have more unfulfilled desires and you will have to take another birth again. And it gets worse and worse each time. Um, if I ask you a question, how many of you have uh, tried sense gratification during this life? Everyone would raise yeah, their hands, hopefully. <laughs> I'll be the first one. <laughs> we have all tried it. And can we say that we have been trying to do sense gratification every day of our life? 
we have, right? That's that's also a fact that we have. Tomorrow we will wake up and we will um, we will at some point in the day try to do some type of sense gratification, whether it's a very tasty item to eat um, or whatever it is. But can we actually, if we just ask ourselves the question, okay, yesterday I was desperate for some item of, for se of sense gratification, and the previous day I was as well, and the, and the previous week, and the previous month, and the previous year, actually right from when I was born, I was striving for items of sense gratification. What is the end result? Right now, right now, what am I thinking? I'm thinking, I'm concocting a new plan for another sense gratification moment. It hasn't solved the problem. By unlimitedly solving our demands for sense gratification, the desire for sense gratification has not reduced. Right? So you could say that we have been doing an activity all our life and that activity has never yielded a result. Because we're still unsatisfied afterwards and we are driven to do it again. <laughs> that means we're not satisfied. After all, when you complete a task, it's complete. Now just imagine how many more days, weeks and months this will go on. Well, the answer is it will go on a very, very long time. In fact, every single birth we take in this world, this will be our preoccupation every day, every day of every life. And if we want to change that, and we recognize that the endless pursuit of sense gratification hasn't brought me much benefit in this life and hasn't given me peace that I'm after, if at that point we start to contemplate, that is the point at which Krishna starts to cleanse desire. That is the point at which Krishna starts to vidunoti, to cleanse this deep-seated desire for material enjoyment. So you see why I said it is dangerous? Because it is the such a deeply ingrained basis for everyone's existence in this material world. So if that was removed, people go crazy. <laughs> and you'll see some people, when they don't get their sense gratification, they go crazy. <laughs> and if they're powerful, they uh, start getting very violent even. There's no, there's no limit to the strange behavior in this world when one is driven by sense gratification. Ravana is one example. He had everything, you know, he had conquered all the planets, he had, he had unlimited servants, unlimited wealth. Kuvera, he had even taken Kuvera's aeroplane. He had, was extremely wealthy, but he wasn't satisfied. And therefore, he made one fatal mistake. He tried to take the property of Lord Ram, which is Mother Sita. So he had everything. He had unlimited sense gratification, but he was still so unsatisfied, he had to go one step further and transgress laws of basic decency, and he tried to steal Mother Sita. So the world is full of such Ravanas, and uh, we have this Ravana propensity within each of us also, isn't it? Ravanas, ten heads, lust, anger, greed, pride, envy, illusion, madness, all of them. These are Ravanas, ten heads. We have each of these propensities within ourselves. And this is exactly what needs to be cleansed. So once we start to hear, once we start to contact the message of the Bhagavatam, we start to hear Krishna's words, uh, we start to hear his messages, his instructions, the guidelines from his devotees, then Krishna starts this process of cleaning, this process of purification. And as that process continues, you can imagine, as these propensities are being cleansed, uh, we are developing a new basis for our life. You know, if our life is no longer based upon greed, pride, envy, lust, hankering, there has to be something else that it is based on. 
And so we increasingly start to be nourished by the mercy of the Lord directly. The rendering of service to the Lord, Sarvopadi vinirmuktam tat paratvena nirmalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti ruchate, as it said, that when one starts to render service to the divine senses of the Lord, Rishikesh, the master of the senses, when one actually starts to serve Krishna's senses instead of their own, one starts to feel unlimitedly happy. That's actually the secret. When we try to feed sense gratification to our senses, we have a big problem. Because as I said, we just keep wanting it wanting to do it again and again because it doesn't satisfy but when we start to satisfy the senses of the Lord we feel unlimited bliss clearly it comes in stages and with our practice as it increases uh, we feel more and more happy content peaceful so these are two points that Prabhupada has mentioned here women and wealth and um, it's, he says it's not an astonishment. So we shouldn't be surprised if, you know, our mind is drawn to these things, drawn to these attractions on a regular basis. But we still have to understand that um, they're not the real shelter in this world. Yeah, they can be distractions. Now clearly money is useful in this world. But it is not ultimately useful because Lakshmi by herself is very chanchal, you know, she is uh, chanchal, that is one of her qualities, she's flickering, she doesn't stay in one place. So you know, you may acquire money and you may lose money also. <laughs> Certainly everyone has that ex experience. She's only happy and steady when Lord Vishnu is there. Lakshmi Narayan. So worship of Narayan is so important if we want to actually keep Lakshmi Devi. Because Lakshmi Devi is meant to be engaged in the service of Narayan. She is one of his servants, not our servant. So the correct way for us to purify our desire to want more and more wealth is to try to engage that wealth in the service of Narayan. And then these two most formidable things, they start to decrease they start to decrease now sometimes the lord has to help you know it's, it's, devotees sometimes don't always give up the propensity for wealth or for uh, or for uh, women or whatever it is for men whatever uh, krishna sometimes has to he has to help a little and that that may change that will be different you know it will change according to our level of advancement the main thing is, do we understand the principle? The principle is that there is, the, there is no real shelter in this world. If you consider that you will be happy by acquiring a big, big bank balance, so you have security in your life, you might be thinking, also I can uh, provide for others, or I can do this or that. Well, all of that can just be, even just materially speaking, it can just be denied to you so quickly. Just with taxes, you can lose lots of wealth. If, uh, if someone decides to freeze your accounts, you can lose wealth. You will not have access to it, even though you've, acquired, you've worked so hard for it. If some foreign government decides to restrain your access to your wealth, that can also happen. It's not a very solid substance. It's not a solid foundation. It is very flickering. And it will not save us from birth, old age, disease and death either. Those things come to everyone, regardless of their level of wealth or their level of sense enjoyment. So they're not the ultimate saviors of this world. So when a devotee starts to become more and more serious, Krishna starts to provide perspective and starts to cleanse these desires from the heart. And the devotee depends on Krishna and Krishna starts to supply everything the devotee needs. So it's a very, very wonderful process. It's a uh, very nice process where uh, uh, we, we have a lot of cleaning to do. Now the Holy Name is very, very powerful and actually the effect of that is, uh, is super, super fast. 
the, cl the cleaning process due to the holy name is extremely quick. We are burning away years and lifetimes worth of uh, anarthas in the heart very quickly with just a few rounds of chanting. But the problem is we are also increasing them. Uh, we may also be feeding them and increasing them as each day. Um, and still you can see it will take some time because there are lifetimes, millions of lifetimes worth of accrued desires, unfulfilled desires that need to be cleansed. So this is why we need a little bit of patience. Prabhupada says uh, it takes time to recover from this foreign nature. It's a foreign nature to be uh, to have anarthas in the heart. It's not natural. It's something foreign. It's a contamination. And it takes a little time. Therefore, at least in this one life, you know, as Prabhupada said, give this one life to Krishna. Each life you've already spent doing sense gratification, punas, punas, jadavita, charvananam, chewing the chewed again and again. As Prabhupada said, give this one life to Krishna. What a great investment that would be. That we would be, if we patiently chant, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, I don't know how old everyone is here, but that probably covers most people. <laughs> Whatever lifespan we have ahead of us, if we chant carefully for that period of time, there will certainly be con a considerable benefit for us. And hopefully, yes, we will develop actual taste for chanting His holy name if we exercise that patience and that humility. Um, yeah, w does anyone have any questions? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, yes, there are some questions in the chat, but um, Prabhuji allowed me to introduce you. I wanted more devotees to join and I, the whole group has joined now. So okay. uh, something that I should have done earlier, I'm doing it now, Prabhuji. <laughs> so, uh, Hare Krishna, everybody, we are really fortunate that today we have His Grace Navadipa Chandra Prabhu, who has been a resident at the Bhaktivedanta Manor for over two decades. And during his time, he has been involved in various services, but specializes in teaching and explaining the scriptures to the community. He has taught a number of courses, including Bhakti Vaibhava, a systematic study of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and continues to support the community in this way. And here he is today with us, supporting our little community as well. So we are really, really um, extremely grateful. Prabhuji, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Kamal Prabhuji in spite of his illness. Um, uh, he has uh, showered his, this is the compassion of devo uh, devotees. He, he quickly got to you to come to our group and um, uh, he didn't want us to miss out on today's um, verse. So we'd really like to acknowledge his presence here today, Prabhuji, and wish him uh, get well soon. And um, we are, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Govinda Prem Das Prabhuji, who is one of our mentors as well in Nairobi. So we are grateful for all our mentors who have joined here to support us um, uh, today. Okay, Prabhuji, we move on to the questions. And the first question is, uh, when devotees suffer to go through pain, why does Krishna tolerate seeing his devotees in pain? Yes, this is a very interesting one, isn't it? Yes, uh, we all experience different types of pain and suffering in our lives. Um, Krishna doesn't really enjoy it. He doesn't enjoy it. But he also knows that it is something that is happening in a situation that we have created for ourselves. And it's not a permanent situation. It's not even a, a real s situation of substance. It is a, it is a very artificial uh, creation, which is very temporary. And um, it is part of the rigid laws of nature. Now we can deal with this in two ways, one, one uh, in terms of devotees and one in terms of people in general. So. Uh, people in general, as I said, they are under the laws of karma, you know, punya pap and their desires, what they want to do and 
what they wish they had done and good things they've done and bad things they've done that combination gives them special uh, you know gives them a package gives you a certain birth gives you certain wealth certain beauty certain level of health power strength each one is different that's what your karma gives you in any particular life and then with your desires you create many many plans for enjoyment and all of that is rigidly governed by the laws of nature Durga Devi is the superintendent in this world and the three modes of nature are the ones you know sometimes we say Durga Devi has a trident and the trident has you know three po three sharp points and these are the three modes goodness passion and ignorance and she pokes the living entities with these <laughs> with this trident and so they get they get a different dose of it each as throughout their lives goodness passion and ignorance and then of course their mentality is situated in in a combination of these modes also so according to all of that a karmi gives gets a dose of happiness and doses of distress continuously throughout their life now with a devotee situation is slightly different um, because first thing is a devotee doesn't wake up one morning and become a, a devotee um, a devotee also progresses from different stages of devotion from the initial stage of wanting to come to Krishna to actually being to actually practicing freeing themselves from sinful life and actually engaging in loving service to the Lord that's quite a progression also now throughout that progression Krishna's involvement with the devotee increases and Maya's involvement decreases and what is the factor that determines that proportion that is the living entity themselves to what extent do they want to put one foot in the boat of Krishna now and keep the other foot in the boat of Maya you know if you imagine there are two boats and you've got one foot in each you might be uh, torn apart a little bit you might struggle you know one pressure this way one pressure that way it's due to us we are we are holding on to the material world this Prabhupada gave gave this analogy of you know a tree a person is hugging the tree if you put your arm around a tree and you say let me go let me go let me go well that's not very sensible because all you have to do if you want to let go is just let go <laughs> it's within your control <laughs> you can't blame the tree because you've put your arm around the tree so we are saying we don't want Maya we want Krishna but all the time we are putting our arms around Maya we are after all of these things lust anger pride envy illusion madness wine women wealth that's what we want and we're saying Maya let me go I want Krishna so there's a you can see there's a period of time over which we slowly transition from being in the material world to being in Krishna's world and under Krishna's internal Shakti instead of the external energy we are in we are supposed to come under the shelter of his internal energy uh, and that takes some time so there will be aspects where a person is experiencing their normal karma and then there will be phases when they are given some special scenario by the Lord then after initiation certain transformations also take place the spiritual master accepts the disciples karma um, and different things happen now the devotee may still after that point experience certain happiness distress uh, difficult situations now those can be of two types they could be uh, direct reactions to offenses we cause or they could be the Lord using our karma from the past rearranging it and giving it to us in certain doses to teach us a lesson now some of us I would say most of all of us practically need a lesson sometimes rather than an in instruction the Lord can tell us don't do this don't do this don't do this but we still do it and then sometimes we need 
a bit of a heavy dose just in order to really appreciate that we shouldn't do this. So that could involve some suffering. That could involve some, some disease, could involve some situation, some situation of poverty perhaps. It could be different. Sometimes people are stuck in long legal battles and it just saps their energy. Somehow different doses of distress may be experienced by the devotee also. But the devotee has to learn to see what is the correct lesson within this. It's not that the Lord enjoys seeing it, but he knows that this person is only getting this, number one, because they have the material body, number two, because they may have tinges of past karma to burn off. And it is best that we get this process accelerated and, and done with in this life. That will free them for a blissful life of Krishna consciousness thereafter. And uh, so um, there can be many reasons why devotees experience suffering. Another item is that sometimes Krishna um, allows a devotee to experience certain suffering in order to set an example for others. Now, if the Lord wants someone to provide a demonstration, now, now if you remember, you know, if you go on a flight, if you fly somewhere, you in the past you would have these, you would have the stewardesses, you know, they would give you a demonstration how to put on the oxygen mask and where the the life jackets are located, and they would stand in the aisle and do all these directions and all of that. They'll give you a demonstration of of what to do. So people like demonstrations. So if the Lord wants to demonstrate something to people in general, he will use who will he use? He will use one of his men, one of his, his devotees. He will use one of his people and they will demonstrate. How do I behave when a dose of material trouble comes my way? Prabhupada had a heart attack on the way to Boston. You know, he had poor health during his years of preaching, 12 years. He had ill health from time to time. He was once attacked by a cow. He underwent many difficulties also. There was one crazy guy in where he was staying, you know, in, in New York, I think it was, and he had to leave the place. So there's dangers, there's troubles, there's distresses. But how did Prabhupada handle it? He handled it with dignity, <clears throat> with grace, and he saw each of those as an opportunity to surrender to Krishna. Now this, this state of mind is an advanced state. Lord Jesus Christ is another, another example. These people tortured him, put him on the cross. And what was he saying? He was saying, forgive them. He was saying, God, forgive them. Because they do not know what they're doing. When you see the behavior of an advanced, saintly person like that, we, we understand a different perspective on how to take miseries and difficulties. That if we're trying to understand the mercy of the Lord, we should, um, we should focus on that as the main factor and see that whatever is going on with me right now is simply a matter of previous karma. That tenu kampasu samikshamana bhunjana evatma kritam that when one tolerates patiently the results of one's past misdeeds, worshipping the Supreme Lord, the gates to heaven are opened. They're not heaven, um, deliberation. Liberation at the lotus feet of the Lord. So if we just live this life, tolerate whatever miseries are due to us, understand they're due to my misdeeds, then we become eligible. We become eligible to receive the grace of the Lord. So we have to just be strong and not be, not be too distracted. And the miseries can be pretty horrendous in this life. But we have to have a, a distant perspective on them. Okay.
Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you very much for that answer because there were a few questions in the chat um, uh, uh, asking, but then as you were saying, their, uh, their answers were um, met. So uh, thank you for this elaborate explanation um, and explanation. Um, Prabhuji, um, there's another question from Vishaka Mataji. Mataji, kindly unmute and ask your question, please. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Um, uh, just uh, li having listened about, um, you mentioned about bondages, you know, when you get tied up like in marriages or, you know, in a relationship, uh, we end up uh, being in a bondage and we create more karmas and it's a vicious circle. So my question is, should one really get married? Should should one, why, why has, has this Grahastha Ashram been encouraged when one gets into that grasta ashram and then all this, no matter how much they want to come out of it, uh, they keep on sinking in it deeper and deeper. So, you know, how, how, how do we uh, resolve this, uh, you know, shouldn't we, one be encouraged not to get married? Well, that's, that's interesting. And uh, uh, Prabhupada, yeah, yes, he did say, best is if one does not get married. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said that, but but we should we should understand also that the, the grihastha ashram is not the cause of these problems. The grihastha ashram is an ashram; it is a place of shelter. It is it is a place where um, one can live uh, with a family, wife, children, relatives, and make progress back to Krishna. The problem comes when instead of Grihastha Ashram, it becomes a Grihamedi lifestyle. So Grihamedi means one considers, you know, the home, uh, the wife, enjoyment, you know, sense gratification to be the center of one's activities. And they work hard day and night, you know, as it says in the Bhagavatam, Nidreya riyate naktam vyavayena chavavayaha diva charte hayarajan kutumba paranenava. The, the, anyway, there's a whole series of verses like this in the beginning of Canto 2. Deha patya kalatradi shivatma senvesh vasatsvapite sham pramatunitthanam pashyanapi na pashyati. The envious householder spends all night indulge, uh, engaged in sex indulgence and all day in work in earning money to feed his family members in their varieties of sense gratification. That's the lifestyle of an envious Grihastha, and that's all there, an, an envious Grihamedi, and that's all there is. But a Grihastha is actually a practitioner in an ashram, a bona fide ashram, which is created by Krishna as part of his system, where one receives the shelter to not have sense gratification of the family members at the center, but to have worship of Krishna at the center. Now, what you say is completely understandable that, you know, as soon as that combination of male and female takes place, the knot is established in the heart, bondage is there, and then griha, kshetra, suta, apta, vitta, all of these things are needed. You know, griha, the home, kshetra, the place, you know, a place to work, suta, relatives, children, uh, apta, uh, other relatives, uh, vitta, money, all of these things come, and they are sources of bondage in this world. But it doesn't have to be like that. We have to change our consciousness. That in my home, Krishna is here. Krishna is here. And the uh, purpose of myself and my family members is to learn to love and serve Krishna. And in the course of that program, of all of us together serving Krishna, we, each person will have their different duties. You know, the wife and the husband, the father and the mother, they will look after the children, they will raise them, they will protect them, they will do everything that is required in order to serve the children. But they won't see that this is my child meant for furthering my agenda, meant for uh, furthering my sense gratification. They will, see, they will see that this is a child who is a child of Krishna's, and Krishna has given this child into my family, into my care, 
for me to look after. Now that's a completely different perspective. If that is the way that you view your relatives, that they are actually Krishna's property, and everything in your house is Krishna's property, you know, the wealth you have, the job you have, the house you have, it's all for Krishna. And you are caretakers of that. That's a different different uh, consciousness altogether. And in that consciousness, one becomes very, very advanced. And the entire family becomes very advanced. And even if, you know, some members of the family decide not to be particularly interested. <laughs> I'm sure in all of your experiences, you will have members of your family who are not interested. <laughs> it's quite common. Still, the potency that you get by yourself practicing and some others practicing means that everyone benefits. So even if they are Grihamedis by nature, they will still benefit when you see them as servants of Krishna, but just in a very bewildered way with lots of desires in their heart. So the Grihastha Ashram is actually a, a tool for uh, remedying the situation. It's not the cause of it. The, the cause of the situation is is our lust and the desire to enjoy in this world. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. We have exhausted our time, but Prabhuji, can I take a liberty of asking one more question from uh, uh, that has been pointed out in the group? Uh, Prabhuji, the question is um, how to purify the soul and how could we maintain the purity considering the material nature of this life? Okay. Well, the soul doesn't need to be purified because the soul is pure. The soul is by nature Satchit Ananda. It is the pure spiritual component and everything else in our body is material. You know, the mind, the intelligence, the ego, that is the subtle body, that's material. Then the gross body with, you know, the organs and the, the hands, the five elements, five gross elements, earth, water, air, fire, ether, that is all, all the gross part of our body, that's material. Subtle and gross are both material and the spirit soul is spiritual. Krishna consciousness is, is dormant. You know, that term dormant means it is naturally a part of the soul. The soul is naturally blissful, naturally eternal, full of knowledge. But because it is covered by this layer of matter, it acts in a different way. It acts in a confused way. Now the soul is very, very happy when it is in contact with spirit. You see, the soul being spiritual can only be satisfied and happy when it is in contact with something spiritual. The body will never satisfy the soul. All the concoctions in our mind, all the plans for happiness, all the plans for acquiring wealth, they won't actually satisfy the soul. The soul will not be happy even after lifetimes of doing this. Why? Because the soul needs to be in its natural position. And its natural position is to have an exchange of service and love with Krishna. The soul has two, two things, you know, you, to love and to be loved. This is, this is what the soul does, to love and to be loved. And these two things are reposed in Krishna, because he's the supreme reservoir of all pleasure the supreme object of love, the supreme provider of love also. So actually chanting the holy name, any spiritual activity we do, and you know it could be in any of these categories, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, nine processes of devotional service, hearing, chanting, meditating on the lotus feet, rendering service, etc. Each of these touches the soul, even if we perform it with the body. Because it is done for Krishna, it is an exchange with him. It actually satisfies the soul very much. So that is how to, how to nourish the soul, by giving it spiritual activities. It will never be happy with any number of material activities or facilities that you give. 
It's like the fish out of water example. You might have heard this. If you take a fish and you take him out of the pond and you put him on a nice golden throne and give him a nice array of fine foodstuffs and you put a crown on his head and you say, hello, Mr. Fish, how are you? And the fish is there gasping, <gasps> gasping for breath. And the fish is thinking, just put me back in the water. I don't care for any of this. So that is how the soul feels. The soul is trapped in this body and it's a prison. It doesn't like to be here. It's trapped in this body and we're feeding it all sorts of things. And the soul is saying, just stop this. I just want to be back with my source of happiness, the Supreme Lord Krishna. So whatever we do in terms of service, hearing, chanting, remembering, worshipping, somehow doing something to serve Krishna, that is the way for the soul to be actually happy. Hare Krishna, I think Truti has got her answer. Prabhuji, we'd like to end the session now because we are past our hour. Uh, I'll hand over to Path Prabhuji, Path Premadas Prabhuji, Hare Krishna. Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. It's Grace Navdeep Chandra Prabhu. We are so grateful, Prabhu, for you, for your nice class, simple and show. How it is a, this is Shrubhanutvam. Shravanam, it is hearing of the Krishna's pastime, it is so important. A very nice class, Prabhuji. And how it is, it cleanses our heart and giving us a fully taste, which always we anxious. Thank you, Prabhuji, for your nice class and show and sweet class. And also thanks all the devotees who are assembling here today. On behalf of this Kanel Lorette, we welcome you. We're so grateful to you, Prabhuji. I request all the devotees, please join me to yourself and chant Hare Krishna Mantra for a glorification of His grace, Navdip Chandra Prabhu. Please join. <coughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Hare. Bancha Kalpa Kalpa